All right, well, welcome everyone to our weekly webinar series uh, today on a Thursday, unlike most days. Thanks for joining us on a little bit different day, so close to the holiday. If you support our mission and want to get instant access to all these webinars, among many other benefits, make sure to go to greenhomeinstitute.org to uh, become a member today. Thanks to our session sponsor, uh, T-STUD. T-STUD is the 2019 Green Builder Media Sustainability Award winner for structural ingenuity. So what is T-STUD? The T-STUD is a game-changing technology. It solves uh, the number one nemesis of the construction industry, how to cost-effectively stop the transfer of outdoor climactic heat or cold from affecting the interior of a structure. Um, in plainer terms, a T-STUD is the best piece of lumber available to minimize the outdoor temperature from coming through all the framing members in a wall uh, that um, hurt heating and cooling bills. It's a thermally broken insulated wall stud assembly for use in exterior walls and party walls. And the T-stud is an engineered building product that uses a two lumber member and an internal truss system. Along with a frost in place closed cell foam that has a global warming potential of less than one and is EPA compliant for 2020. Uh, the T-STUD provides a 99% complete thermal break to the wall assembly. With just one product, the T-STUD raises the bar on six major construction concerns, thermal breaks, structural strength, wind loads, sound transmission, fire and life safety, mold and termites. The T-STUD really isn't complicated. It's quite easy to replace the traditional two by lumber with the T-STUD with little to no additional training. Plus it can be used as many different components, studs, jack studs, king studs, sills, cripples, headers, top and bottom plate, um, and in many cases uh, can now so soon be used for um, uh, flooring uh, and roofing. Um, the future of the T-Stud is to create a roof truss and floor truss compromise of the T-Stud to provide a complete thermal break throughout the entire structure. Two by eights will be available besides the two by six as well. Check them out at tstud.com. And also thanks to the session sponsor built to you by, uh, brought to you by Build Equinox featuring the new Serve 2 a smart uh, uh, ventilation system that also has a heating and com cooling component. Check them out at buildingequinox.com. All right, well, welcome to Handling Humidity. Your project's health depends on it. This course is approved for many different CUs, and this uh, one we're specifically excited to be seeing uh, the LEED AP Homes credential, as well as the Certified Passive House Consultant. Uh, also, it's a applicable to your health, welfare, and safety HSW um, AIA credential, which may make it uh, useful for reporting state-based design um, or uh, construction licenses. Uh, today, I'll be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I'm the executive director here at the Green Home Institute. And today, we're going to be talking about um, strategies and new ideas to best handling the humidity uh, within our homes. So I'm very excited to have uh, Ty Newell, co-owner and co-founder of Build Equinox, a company devoted to inventing technologies for healthy, comfortable, and sustainable living. Ty lives uh, the zero energy life, as we call it, with a 100% solar powered home and cars um, in Urbana, Illinois, that features automated fresh air control, such as the Serve, and is the first home within um, an Illinois municipality to be permitted for rainwater harvesting and use. Um, his company, Build Equinox, is located in a 4,500-square-foot 4, Morton building in Urbana, Illinois, and is also 100% solar-powered. Uh, so with that, Ty, um, we will hand it off to you and have you please take it away. Thank you, Brett. Um, see if I can get the screen going here. And um, I'd like to thank the Green Home Institute for putting this together on short notice and as well as uh, express my appreciation to those of you who have uh, signed in. Um, we, um, we're rolling out a series of reports that will discuss some of the highlights of those uh, in this talk. And, and um, as we began rolling those out with our newsletter this week, it just seemed like uh, maybe we could put together a webinar uh, since this is a time when a lot of us are thinking about humidity. And, um, and we appreciate Brett for pulling things together and getting this out uh, to all of you. And so uh, uh, 
we will look forward to discussing this and then hearing your questions as we uh, as we move through the material. Uh, please send in questions. Brett will break in. Um, you know, I'm usually oblivious to what's going on on the screen, but he'll break in with any questions so that we can uh, answer them as they come up. And, um, you know, as, as Brett mentioned, our, our mission is it's a simple one. And I think Aldo Leopold expresses it best, uh, as he had said, uh, how do we live on a piece of land without spoiling it? And that really is what what drives us here. Um, We've been doing moisture management for many, many years, uh, thousands of years. But as far as say the modern era, one could go back a little over a hundred years to this building in Brooklyn. Uh, and this building was a, a lithography and printing business. And Willis Carrier, who was a young engineer working with Buffalo Forge, a fan manufacturer at the time, developed the first building air conditioning system, but it wasn't built for cooling and comfort of the inhabitant of the building occupants. It was built to dehumidify the building because the printing presses during New York's muggy summer, muggy summers um, didn't work all that well. One of the uh, unique characteristics of his dehumidification system that surprises a lot of people is that he dehumidified the air by spraying water into the air. So as a, a large Buffalo Forge fan was pulling air in from the building, he sprayed cold water in and the water was cold enough below dew point that that would cause water vapor from the air to condense with the droplets and, uh, and keep the building cool. Here's a, a cafe in Amherst, Massachusetts. You know, we usually think of Florida, the Gulf Coast as some of our warmest, muggiest, most humid areas of the country, but most of our country, most of North America experiences warm, humid weather to some degree for some period of time. And uh, on this particular day, when I happened through there, uh, it was dripping inside and out. You can see the windows on the outside dripping and for sure there's concerns as far as uh, that happening a lot and degradation of building materials. But on the inside with uninsulated ducts and with the warm, humid weather they were experiencing, that uh, these ducts were then dripping on all the customers as well as just a very high level of humidity that was just not very conducive for sitting down and eating a bagel and having a cup of coffee. More than comfort, and comfort's important because productivity is directly related to how comfortable we are, but our health is also impacted by moisture when it's not managed properly. This, uh, this plot shows residences with mold, and each of these dots represents a military facility and uh, with upwards of 40 or more private residences that are rented to uh, service personnel. And out of these residences with mold, some as many as 70% of residences at one base having, uh, having mold, that roughly one in four, 25% of the residences with visible mold also report somebody with an environmental illness that they ascribe to their housing. It doesn't mean mold is the cause of it, although certainly in many cases, it is the cause of environmental illness, but it's also an indicator, um, a surrogate for other things in the air quality that are not being managed well, whether endotoxins or uh, not having fresh enough air, so VOCs and CO2 and other things also uh, being poorly controlled. And even though this is military housing, this is uh, one of the largest studies I know of, uh, 16,000 survey responses from over 100 military facilities around uh, North America. And um, 
And this data that you're looking at is for uh, bases with more than um, say 40 uh, say, uh, single family dwellings and, um, and represents about 7,000 or so housing units. And you can also see at the Southeast with the orange does tend to have a bit more humid conditions with associated mold and environmental illness and the gray dots that are outlined um, some bases that are Nevada, New Mexico, and some of the more arid regions of North America. But they all have significant levels of mold with associated environmental illness. And a report that we wrote in July that's posted on our website that you have access to. This goes into more detail, but the correlation analysis that we did on these results strongly shows that mold is related to poorly functioning HVAC systems or ones that aren't operating at proper capacity, as well as plumbing issues, leakage and things. And um, but moisture must be managed and we must stay on top of it throughout uh, most of the country. The four um, reports that we're releasing, one that we just released this week, which primarily uh, looks at how moisture, um, the moisture balance in a home from the moisture we generate from our respiration and cooking and other processes, the moisture that moves through our, our homes with as infiltration, and the moisture it moves into our homes with ventilation air. The second um, report that will be released in September then examines more directly the psychrometrics and in more detail uh, weather characteristics around North America uh, with the idea of giving some idea between, say, Florida to California to New Mexico to Minnesota to the New England area, uh, how our moisture handling, um, uh, how that changes throughout the country and tries to give a systematic view of how moisture changes throughout North America, uh, but it's applicable beyond. In October, we'll release a third report, which then looks at the systems that manage moisture. How much moisture does a typical air conditioner take out of, um, out of the home? How much is it capable of? Uh, in our case, as far as a smart ventilator that also has some moisture management capabilities, how much can it take out? The new era of heat pump water heaters, um, a significant gain in energy performance for any home also um, acts in a beneficial manner as far as managing humidity and then dehumidifiers and so this third report studies uh, and presents characteristics of these type of machines and what you need in a given uh, location around the country to manage moisture and then finally the last report we'll release in november looks at the whole house uh, in perspective with the energy loads for a house in Florida versus a house in Seattle or anywhere else, how important is it to seal a home? How important is it to manage the ventilation carefully? And what kind of moisture loads and then resulting energy loads does that, uh, uh, does that result in? This talk, we're gonna touch on each of these four topics that will be in these reports. And the end result is simply something that many of you already know, build tight, seal it up as tight as is practically and economically possible. In some cases with renovation, maybe there's some limitations, new construction for sure. There really are no excuses for not building tight uh, these days. And then ventilate smart. And we'll discuss what smart ventilation consists of within this talk. Thanks for watching. Please continue to watch the next part of the session to complete the course and get your continuing education credits. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube 
to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.